uh, to the two naval chiefs, both for South Africa and Nigeria, the ambassador that is here today, and to all the distinguished guests. Uh, good day. I am uh, pleased to have this opportunity and also to be allowed just to to get crash in this uh, conference, which I believe it was actually uh, necessary and important. So my talk basically will be try to bring the the air dimension uh, to this whole uh, discussion today. Uh, I sincerely do believe that going forward, we need to ensure that the collaboration between the approach uh, by the naval forces and also by the air and space power is important in, in this kind of uh, challenge. The unchangeable uh, geographic arrangement between sea and land mass in terms of size, I believe it echoes a subtle but consistent message uh, to the human race. And the message is very simple. Do not ignore what is going on in the sea. Because if you ignore what is going on in the sea, uh, it will be basically to your own peril. The nations of the world rich or poor cannot do without the sea. The countries also continue to pursue and exploit opportunities uh, at, uh, in the sea. And this shall remain an endless and attractive endeavor. The continuous maritime security threats are marked and defined by the polarization in the world in terms of rich and the poor. This is basically an agonizing separation gap that continues to grow unabated. But on closer scrutiny, there is an undeniable nexus between uh, poverty and maritime security threats. There is also an inverse and converse impact relationship between what is happening in the sea and what is happening on the land. So it also tells us that the attention span of governments requires a very healthy balance between the land and, and, and what is happening in the sea. The air and space power offers limited range of opportunities for countries to explore in their endeavor to mitigate against the prevailing maritime security threats. However, all the time, an ugly head uh, of rich and, power and poor keeps on rising. It keeps on rising and it presents a hindrance for countries to optimize on the opportunities that are there. This challenge should not be a reason to surrender, but instead it must ignite and propel the will of nations to relentlessly explore the ways and means to overcome these challenges. And I believe the gathering of today actually speaks to this. And it is also a paramount example in terms of what we are faced with. Given the vastness of the sea and the uh, the vastness of the sea and the interconnected, interconnectedness of the world through sea trade, it forces everyone to acknowledge the indispensable and intrinsic value of network collaboration across all nations. Uh, it's important that we collaborate to mitigate against the ongoing maritime security threats. Also, again, the world globalization and the endeavors towards creating a single global village necessitates and enhances the principle of collaboration to resolve the diverse global challenges that we have. And as we continue, uh, it is important that we realize that the natural resources, resources are national assets that may be exploited, but they must be protected. The fisheries industry employs many people and as such is a major contributor to household income. Fisheries are crucial uh, in terms of reduction of poverty. We must recall that a substantial number of South African communities also depend on the traditional fishing and also uh, for their subs subsistence uh, living in terms of uh, small scale fishing. The thrive and decline of local coastal economies is directly influenced by maritime activities. 
the coastal communities livelihoods can be complete, completely obliterated by the lack of maritime security measures and poor maritime industry strategies and policies implementation. The South African situation is evidence of such a scenario. Large sale of abalone poaching is actually a, a living example in South Africa. Uh, we, the, the, the South African situation is evidence of such a, a scenario. Large sale of abalone poaching is a recent phenomenon in South Africa as the quotas for restricting the maximum catch species such as abalone were introduced uh, as far as in 1960. However, poaching remained a very low uh, level for several decades. However, the situation actually changed uh, around the 1990s. And during this period, the government tried to create a more equitable licensing uh, in terms of the catch, the catch uh, quotas uh, system. Consequently, the enforcement efforts against poaching were significantly expanded, penalties increased, uh, penalties were increased and special environmental courts were also introduced. It is these new policies that had unintended consequences, favoring the newcomer commercial uh, fishing operators who had relied on small scale fishing for their livelihoods. Uh, the slide up there actually indicates what the problem of uh, abalone poaching has actually done in South Africa. Between the period of 2006 uh, to 2019, uh, 1,059 kilograms of abalone were confiscated as indicated in that uh, slide that is in front of you. So this actually indicates the scale on which the, the problem actually has escalated ever since these policies were introduced. And again, it is estimated that uh, about 22 billion uh, USD has been spent by different governments every year to offset the cost of expenses such as fuel, fishing gear, and building new vessels. And these payments, as you can see, they actually uh, move towards the building of the fishing industries, the professional ones. But the problem that comes with this kind of approach is that uh, there is no balance between what governments are doing in actually enhancing the, the professional uh, fishing industry uh, against those who are actually uh, living in a small scale uh, fishing activities. There is no balance. So what practically happens is that there are unintended consequences that comes with these uh, kinds of policies. The world's fishing uh, vessels have the capacity to catch more fish, but uh, the counter is that those who are using their ordinary fishing, um, uh, fishing uh, th those who are using the ordinary fishing vessels, uh, they end up on the lower end of the scale because they are not in a position to do uh, to or to to make more uh, catch as opposed to the to the to the ones that are, are are professional. So what the net effect of all these is that the 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 small scale fishermen end up not having what they are. Uh, able to, to, to fish and also to provide for their families. This is a very big disproportionate that is actually happening. Now, if you continue uh, looking at this problem, those uh, policies that are embedded and that, they, that now ultimately become uh, part of the, the policies of government end up in a situation whereby the smaller uh, fish, fisheries are not in a position to sustain themselves in many parts of, of the continent. Subsidies often favor the big uh, fishing and larger scale vessels. Such subsidies uh, are undoubtedly harmful by encouraging waste, wasteful use of fuel 
and also supporting destructive fishing practices, such as deep trolling that is happening. But once subsidies are actually embedded in government policies, uh, the rules are very hard actually to change them because they are already embedded in the uh, government uh, policies. Huge subsidies provide the economic incentives to continue fishing even when fish stocks are already declining, which brings actually a bigger problem. This means that it will be much more difficult uh, uh, for much needed efforts to build stocks through catch controls and improve management uh, to be successful. The other problem is subsidies actually benefits or encouraged illegal activities. Illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing is a driver or is a driver of declines in fish populations and harmful subsidies that, are ex that actually continue to exacerbate the problem. Experts also estimate that billions of dollars in government funding every year goes to support the illegal fishing activities of distant water fleets that steal the resources and security from coastal communities. Illicit operations are often connected to human trafficking and slavery at sea, which also disproportionately affect the, coast, the most vulnerable coastal communities. The time to end harmful fishery subsidies is now. The World Trade Organization is negotiating to a, uh, for an end to harmful subsidies in the fishing sector, but they have been at this for a long time. If those funds can be used for improved governance and fisheries management, the reward will be a healthy and productive marine environment and abundant uh, fish populations and sustainable for the livelihoods of these communities for a long time. Now, if you look into the evolution of uh, maritime threats, it's important that we, we take note that the challenges of maritime security have many faces. Piracy and armed robbery, maritime terrorism, illicit traffic, trafficking by sea, narcotics, trafficking, small arms, and so on and so forth. Transnational uh, forces and irregular challenges continue to be a primary threat today and in the foreseeable future. Maritime security is a combination of preventive and responsive measures to protect the maritime domain against threats and, inten and intentional unlawful acts. We must focus on the key weights that are embedded here. It is preventive, responsive measures aiming at both law enforcement as a civilian and military requirement and defense operations as a military. In this case, naval, naval requirements. Maritime safety is the combination of both preventive and responsive measures intended to protect the maritime domain against the limit uh, and the limit effect, accident and or natural danger, harm and damage to environment, risk or loss. Maritime security is a responsibility which has no clear definitions when it comes to maritime security operations. It is actually involving the governmental responsibility the authority to act on behalf of the state, uh, the, the authority to act on behalf of a state is also a sovereign decision with different options. This has a, 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 a very strong influence on maritime collaboration. It has no universal legal or agreed definition due to the fact that it is a broad topic covering many, many aspects. Maritime security is also characterized by its complex and cross-cutting nature. It incorporates a wide range of security concerns, including traditional themes, uh, geopolitics, and naval competition challenges, such as piracy, smuggling, illegal migration, trafficking, and fishery crimes. The spillover of conflict the spillover of conflict and state fragility 
into the maritime domain and issues relating to the environment protection and so-called blue, blue growth. Maritime security practitioners need to adopt a holistic view of maritime security and understand the interlinkages between problems and the unintended consequences of responses. Maritime security governance and capacity building pose a different order of challenge in a country with a history of maritime engagement, stable government and strong institutions, than in a conflict afflicted, fragmented, or weak state environments. Lack of awareness of the importance of the sea means that it can be an uphill struggle to gain political attention or resources for revising maritime security policies and building capacity. The complexity of maritime security also stems from its often transnational nature in that security challenges take place across and outside the territorial boundaries of individual states. Such complexity implies that narrow or isolated responses to maritime security, which for instance address only one of maritime crime, are unlikely to succeed and may even prove counterproductive. Maritime security Maritime security practitioners need to adopt a holistic view of maritime security and understand how problems interlink. Now, when we look into the air and space power dimension, the lack of visibility and awareness. Historically, maritime security has been a relatively minor concern in many countries. In some cases, Countries lack a strong maritime tradition or seagoing history. In others, security or economic development concerns have traditionally derived from the land. Elsewhere, this is because the international maritime order has been relatively untroubled for much of the past few decades and has therefore demanded little in the way of political attention. Public awareness of maritime issues may also be limited particularly outside the specific locations, such as port cities and fishing communities. In these ways, the importance of the sea has become hidden. This tendency towards the sea blindness is changing, both because the rise of various new security challenges at sea, as well as the increasing importance uh, attached to the blue economy agenda particularly in the global south. Even so, maritime issues can often be accorded to lower political uh, priority than over policy areas. And existing institutional and human resources are often more limited in the maritime sector than elsewhere. So these legacies of sea blindness mean that it can be an uphill struggle to gain political attention or resources for revising maritime security policies and building capacity. The air power assets, the ability to see, decide, and act timelessly remains a very key element in dealing with the maritime security threats. The awareness alone does not solve the problem, but a variety of action plans through employment of a relevant mix of resources becomes paramount. Reflecting on the South African Air Force mandate from the perspective of the South African Defense Review of 2015. Open quotes. South Africa requires a responsive and agile air defense capability to defend and protect the integrity of South Africa's airspace through the application of air power and support the landward and maritime strategies. The air defense capability must provide deterrence and powerful intervention during joint, capability, during, during joint operations, specifically through comprehensive air domain awareness. Air operations specifically through comprehensive air domain awareness, air combat and combat support, and air mobility capabilities. Deployed landward and maritime forces must be supported through appropriate airspace control, reconnaissance, 
close air support, augmentation of firepower, and inter- and intra-theater air mobility complex operation circumstances. Again, the Defense Review further elaborates that as a trading nation, over 95% of our trade being reliant on maritime trade routes, the security of South Africa and its people is crucially dependent on the ability of trade, grow the economy, reduce poverty, and provide meaningful work for South African people. The attributes of air power, the attributes of air power, can you go up? The attributes uh, of the attributes of air power remain relevant as part of combined uh, suite to attend to the prevailing challenges of maritime security. The capabilities of air power are responsiveness, mobility, and perspective. When we talk of responsiveness, responsiveness, it is it is made possible from air power's unequal speed and range when operating in elevation. Responsiveness emphasizes speed. Speed permits air power to respond, to react quickly to changing situations. The ever-changing maritime security threats at sea requires air power capabilities that can meet these contemporary security threats. As you can see, the South African Air Force at the moment has got a very minuscule maritime capability, which is inconsistent with the current threat as we see. The current South African Air Force assets, as pictured above, cannot be viewed as acceptable and relevant to attend to the current maritime security threats. During the national uh, budget speech seven years ago, Minister Pravin Goldan actually approved uh, the acquisition of a new maritime uh, surveillance aircraft for the South African Air Force. Uh, the relevance of this capability is actually exponentially pronounced today than it was in 2015. The delay enhances the South Africa's maritime security vulnerability on a continuous basis. Given the diverse needs of the SANDF and the country, it will be prudent that such a capability must actually be a multi-role uh, capability. If one looks at the ideal combination of assets uh, for maritime uh, security threat, it is those assets that are depicted there. It is not only the, the fixed asset, but also it is also assets that are deployed from the airspace. Therefore, notwithstanding our current budget limitations, the relevant maritime air capabilities cannot be wished away because the maritime threats are ever escalating. Therefore, a combination of capabilities such as the maritime patrol and the maritime surveillance aircraft, drones, satellites, airborne early warning, in-flight refueling, etc., are necessary. The advent of the new technologies in the air and space domains will continue to introduce the new thinking approaches to assets into the future. In this regard, it remains important to continue with research and development activities. The, the space power is what we need to exploit. What is it exactly? It is a theory of space power has to explain and translate action into space, into strategic effect on Earth and vice versa. It must take account not only space power, but also effect and influence of land and air, sea power, nuclear and information operations, as well as special operations upon each other and upon space power. A theory of space power also has to consider the roles and influence of science, technology, politics, law, diplomacy, society, and economics, amongst others. It is a daunting task. It is therefore, it is because it is of its intimidating nature that we must be interested and focused on it, as it presents multiple opportunities. However, the airspace domain has been ignored for too long 
to the detriment of our national security. The country, the region, and the continent. Diverse opportunities have been missed, and our voice has been silent on airspace matters that are directly, that, are a, a, that have a direct bearing on our key economy, economic and security interest. The space power in the continent cannot, the, is important. The African continent cannot afford to take a back seat on matters of space power, despite the challenges that are embedded in this domain. I believe there are possibilities which can be explored in sponsoring joint research space projects through institutions such as CSIR. There is also a large pool of resources that still remain untapped in the form of African scientists diaspora who are scattered around the world. They have gone out of the continent for various reasons, but they still have a very deep uh, patriotic African continent spirit. It is my considered view that they would not resist any invitation for mobilizing them for major scientific projects that will benefit their continent. Great visions that are daunting, such as space power, is what motivates scientists, and the African continent is not poor, but very rich in various natural resources. So if we look at the capabilities that we have in the form of CSIR, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that are, are happening in that space. The ZA Cube 2 uh, space space uh, capability is what is being developed at CSIR at the moment. And it talks to the space nano satellites, which is a modern approach to launching and operating space satellites uh, from CSIR. The major benefit is low cost of launch and the ability to launch in numbers to form a constellation. South Africa has a very strong space satellite industry concentrated in the Western Cape. The CSIR, in partnership with the CPUT, developed a nanosat called ZA Cube 2, which I have displayed on the, on, the, on the slide. And this was launched in 2018. ZA Cube 2 has two missions with ship traffic monitoring over oceans as a primary mission, and also forest fire detection of a land uh, as a secondary mission. Maritime security considerations, the mission objective, what activities are to be detected and highlighted by the system. The multi-mission objectives on a single satellite or constellation are a possibility as achieved by ZA Cube 2. Sizes of targets to be detected, tracked, and identified this drives the performance requirements of the surveillance uh, system. Required fresh rate, this influences the number of nano uh, satellites and the orbit selection. South Africa has a strong space satellite industry concentrated in the Western Cape. This capability can be mobilized towards a common national goal. There are other space capabilities that are existing also elsewhere in the world. In India, for instance, uh, there is a, a, an automatic identification system that has been developed uh, by, by, by India, and they are involved in terms of monitoring uh, many activities that are happening in other, in other countries. First and foremost, the writer, uh, Cyril Butler, also zoomed into the automatic identification system where the motivation behind the development of IAS was avoid collusion, uh, to avoid collusion between vessels, but it had limitations. For instance, the, the VHF capability range was just 10 to 20 nautical miles and the ships could turn off the uh, automatic identification system when they didn't want to get detected. So it means the, the, those who are having ill intentions can actually uh, switch off uh, those transponders. 
The maritime domain awareness is crucial for maritime security and uh, without understanding maritime domain, one cannot protect it from innumerable threats. The extraction and accumulation of intelligence in real time and ensuring that it reaches the desires, desired destination in real time require communication, surveillance, and navigation, which are only possible using satellites. Satellites were seen as a solution to these challenges as the view from space, uh, different covering a large area. The satellite automatic identification system was developed as a result. It is also being used by states to manage and control maritime traffic and helps navigation using special application called uh, AIS aids and navigation which further helps in the search and rescue operations. Please, you can go up to Africa initiatives. Just page up. Page up. I just want to summarize. Page up. Network cooperation, yes. Also, I would like to highlight that also uh, the continent has been busy in terms of the network collaboration dividends. When the UN uh, Convention on Law on the Sea, UNCLOS, was adopted, it gave us a significant new rights to states, but it also established duties for safety of activities at sea. The fight against crime at sea and the protection of the maritime environment. It quickly became clear that many states lacked the capacity to execute their rights, perform their duties and contribute to the protection of the global commons. Building has been complemented by international agreements by international agreements addressing issues such as transnational organized crime, transnational terrorism, port security, fisheries, crime, and others. These legal tools have further increased the need for building capacity. Moreover, there is a new and growing awareness of the general importance of oceans of the global economy and economic development. Also, the continent has not lagged behind if one looks at what has been happening in Somali pirates that started attacking and, and seizing uh, commercial vessels in the Indian Ocean since 2005, the South African Development Community, SADC member states, has had to take steps to confront the growing problem that has confronted the shipping industry over the past few years. This included at least six vessels registered or belonging to the SADC countries that have been attacked or seized by the Somali pirates since 2007. These included the Tanzanian registered ships, uh, FV Mavuno 1 and 2, captured in, in May 2007, and the Seychelles yacht, which was also uh, captured uh, in 2009. These hijackings intensified around in 2010, and at least three SADC registered vessels were attacked. Uh, these included uh, the Tanzanian registered uh, MV Barakala 1, the South African owned uh, SY Choizil and Mozambique FV Vega 5. This prompted SADC countries to deepen cooperation in the area of maritime security. So the countries then engaged in a bilateral, uh, bilateral and multilateral anti-piracy efforts to boost the security in Mozambique Channel. This led to the establishment of Operation COPA. That was a deployment of the SANDF maritime surveillance aircraft and frigate with a helicopter on board to cut off the pirate attempts uh, to dominate the Mozambican Channel uh, in 2011. And subsequent to this, a memorandum of understanding was, was signed by South Africa and Mozambique. However, the same could not be said in the Gulf of Guinea as the Paris at that time was increasing. This led also to the Yaounde Code of Conduct concerning the repression of piracy, armed robbery against ships and illicit maritime activity in the West Central Africa. As it has been this morning, as this has been alluded this morning by the chief of the 
as it was alluded this morning in the uh, speech by the chief of the uh, Nigerian Navy, there has been a, a major successes in the western uh, in the, in the in the western uh, region of uh, Guinea, where the piracy once had a, a a big a big hold, but now the 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 issues have been attended to, and we have had a very comprehensive briefing this morning from the chief of the Ni of the Nigerian Navy. Now, when coming to the conclusion. The maritime security challenges facing the continent are diverse and complex, but not impossible to overcome. The power of collaboration in the different regions of the continent to address these problems can deliver the required solutions. While we agree that the business of securing our African shores and maritime security and maritime resources is not cheap, however, we are equally convinced that the African continent is not poor at all. In the words of, in the words of President Paul Kagame, we are even begging for things we already have. That is absolutely a failure of mindset. It is essential that Africa begins to change and discard this mindset. The importance of understanding the connection between maritime insecurity, poverty, unemployment, and crime is critical. Therefore, governments should take a fresh look with regards to how certain policy directives around maritime economic strategy and their implementation can result into unintended consequences to those who entirely depend on the sea for day-to-day living. The space power domain and the potential opportunities it possesses requires us to be relentless in our quest for search and development funding. Therefore, continuous support of research institutions such as CSIR remains paramount. Their protection in terms of the generated intellectual property is equally important. If you, want to, to, if you want to move quick, walk alone. But if you want to get far ahead without exhaustion, walk with someone. Therefore, I am convinced that maritime security conferences of the future should not be a matter of concern for naval forces alone, but the Air Force must be a natural partner going forward. I thank you.